makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London with the conversations that matter. And here's what's coming up on today's program. Jay Powell signals the Fed will wait longer than previously anticipated to cut rates following a series of surprisingly high inflation readings. Now, the latest CPI numbers in the UK are also stronger than expected on higher fuel prices. We'll talk to the former UK Chancellor, Philip Hammond. Plus, chip machine giant ASML misses estimates on first quarter bookings, but it signals a stronger second half and sticks to its guidance. So we'll talk about chips, we'll talk about some of the technology stocks. You can see this is the mood across the European markets. We're seeing a little bit of a lift, but again, this is after a very difficult week for equities so far. So there's a semblance of calm. I say semblance because it all has to do with dollar. And the question out there on everyone's lips is actually how much pain will the dollar inflict not only on emerging markets, but actually on companies across the board. So you can see uh, Bloomberg US dollar will also show you actually, for example, Euro dollar, Overall, but Treasury yields also uh, trading near this narrow range, near 2024 high. So we'll get you some of the Treasury yields on the two and the ten year. So Powell's hawkish comments are shaping a lot of today's narrative. So for all of this, let's bring in Lucy Baldwin, Global Head of Research at Citigroup. Lucy, we're lucky to have you on a week. I mean, I feel like everything's fallen out of bed in the last week and a half, right? So it's very clear that there's a function. We look at treasuries a dollar higher and equities down. Like, for how much longer are we going to see this divergence? Yeah, good morning. Great to be here this morning. And yes, yeah, you say there's an awful lot happening in markets. And from a macro perspective, quite a lot has changed because, as you say, the data in the US particularly has been incredibly strong. Uh, and obviously, those expectations of rate cuts have been pushed further and further out. And I think certainly the data that we've had from a CPI perspective, from a retail sales perspective, all of which have led to these comments that we've just had from Powell that essentially we're going to see those, those rate cuts starting later than previously expected. And again, even closer to home here in the UK, we've had it, the UK data coming out this morning again, also really testing even our own narrative. You know, we've expected to see cuts starting in the UK in June. We'd even thought May might have been a live meeting. But this last mile of inflation and getting it under control is really proving to be quite a struggle. And, you know, obviously in the UK example, it's a small open economy. That services inflation really proving very sticky for the for Bank of England to see coming down to the levels that they would need to get that comfort to start that cutting cycle, which, of course, is what markets, as you alluded to, are waiting to see. Yeah, so Lucy, when you look actually at the inflation figures, and again, we spoke to the Chancellor yesterday, Andrew Bailey was also speaking at the IMF, so I don't know whether that narrative really goes out the window or needs to be repriced, but it, a lot of it has to, to, to do with fuel. Yes, I think you're right. I think the good news from to even today's inflation numbers in the UK, I was speaking to Ben Nabarro, our economist, this morning. Under the hood, actually, it's not as bad as the headlines suggest. You know, we'd, we'd hoped it would be nearer the 3% overall level for CPI, and we'd hoped that services component would be below the, you know, well below the 6, really. And I think that is what you probably need to see to start that June cutting. And again, it's a little bit like the US story, you know, and for us, we're going to be really looking very closely at core PCE next week in the US. And I think that number is really critical. Like we think it probably has to come in at 2.7%. Uh, otherwise, I think the, our expectation that you could still see those June cuts in the US probably starts to get really challenged. And then you get into a very difficult period for the Fed to cut, particularly with the election cycle then coming up. And like, if you start cutting in, say, September, it's really probably very close to that election window. I mean, Larry Summers is definitely an outlier, but he's also you know, saying we can't underestimate the fact that the next move could, could be higher. Yeah, I think uh, there is definitely some risks that that, that that could be the case because of that stickiness. And I think when you and I spoke a while ago, some of the easing in financial conditions that we've well, seen uh, at the back end of last year has perhaps triggered some of this stickiness and some of this reacceleration in certain pockets of the economy. But what I would just say with the US in particular is some of the labour market data perhaps isn't as good as, as perhaps even Powell thinks it is, or at least the narrative suggests they believe it is. There are definitely cracks forming. I think even if you look at like part-time jobs versus full-time jobs, that's a sort of set of data that tends to lead payrolls. And I think, again, that is 
suggesting some of those cracks are likely to come through more substantially to the US. And to our mind, the risk is the longer we see these central banks waiting to cut rates, the bigger the risk to the underlying economy. Probably the more easing then needs to happen if it's later. And the risk that you do really start to see a few recessions kicking in more meaningfully around the world, I think, grows, Francine. So I guess that's a, a problem for the end of the year. <laughs> is, is the dollar strength more problematic for certain you know, asset classes? Yeah, I think as we're seeing even this morning, right, that sort of FX vol is really likely to pick up. You know, you're going to see that risk for emerging markets yeah. growing. It's going to be very difficult for them to perform with that dollar strength. And I think, you know, the dollar strength narrative had been something we'd expected to see at the back end of the year. But now we're obviously getting that earlier on. And I, I agree with you. I think there's going to be certain asset classes that are really going to find it difficult to perform well. And certain companies, of course, they are going to see their earnings downgraded on the back of that, yeah. which makes the Goldilocks scenario that many people have been expecting, particularly for the S&P, really it difficult possible. to achieve now you know our Goldilocks scenario is 5700 but that is predicated on those rate cuts coming through which as we discussed are being priced out by the market but also better growth coming through from these companies and I think to get those two things together is looking more and more challenged of course I think if you've got a better growth narrative for the markets equity markets can cope with rates being priced out but if, if those rate heights being priced out are really because inflation is incredibly sticky and problematic and growth isn't as good as we think or hope, that's a really big challenge to hold even these levels. But Lucy, so to your very good point, if they actually wait too much and then have to cut quite rapidly, risking, I, I don't know whether it's bubble, like how do you construct your portfolio now to make sure that you don't get burned out in, in a couple of quarters? And I think because there's so much complexity and uncertainty around the world, broad diversification is absolutely key. So we do still like US equities here uh, for a number of mm -hmm. reasons. But we would also be fairly thoughtful around, uh, for example, rates. Right? We like US rates, we like mm -hmm. European rates. And again, some of that is predicated on the likelihood that the ECB is now going to be the first to cut. You know, again, we've heard those indications that probably most likely they're going to go into... Which is for the ECB, by the way. Yeah, right? <laughs> indeed. Indeed. From a, from a rates perspective now, I think that is the consensus, is that they will be obviously starting to cut in June. There's now this big question mark, even from this morning, with the data we saw in the UK and the wage data yesterday in the UK, maybe the UK can't go as no. early as June. And I think for the US, again, as discussed, that's been pushed out. So given that dynamic, we do like US and we like European rates relative to the US. And I think that is going to open up a number of other uh, trading opportunities for investors around that theme as well, given the underlying dynamics of growth really quite different now between the UK and Europe versus the US, well below those pre-pandemic uh, levels in the US and Europe relative to the US where you've got this very strong demand side coming through. Lucy, thank you so much for joining us. Lucy Baldwin, their global head of research at Citigroup. But now we're also getting some breaking news on a corporate Toshiba planning to cut 5,000 jobs in Japan. That's according to the Nikkei. Now coming up, UK inflation is slowing less than expected last month as fuel prices crept higher. We'll discuss the economic outlook with Philip Hammond, the former UK Chancellor of the Exchequer. We'll also talk defense. This is Bloomberg. Now that situation we were in 18 months ago with inflation at 11.1%, that is well and truly behind us. We think we have very strong growth prospects. Now the feel-good factor is uh, interest rates start to come down, as people start to feel higher real disposable incomes, uh, will be stronger in people's minds uh, come the early autumn. Well, that is the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, speaking to us in New York yesterday. Let's stay on the UK economy. Inflation slowing less than expected last month as fuel prices crept higher, underscoring the reluctance of central banks to actually begin cutting rates. Well, here to discuss the UK's economic outlook is the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Philip Hammond. Um, Mr. Hammond, thank you for joining us. I mean, it, we talk about the economy, but also you're also Defence Secretary, and it almost feels almost more important in this day and age with all of the uncertainty and the defence spending. Would you, first of all, agree with... Uh, you know, former defence secretaries, that we just have to increase defence spending now? Well, I think we will have to increase defence spending in a, in a measured way over a period of time. Uh, and I think a great deal depends on, post the American elections, what the position of the US is around NATO in Europe and how, how clearly we can rely on the continuing guarantee of uh, the American 
alliance in the defense of Europe in the future against potential Russian aggression. But there's no doubt we're not spending enough on defense. None of us are spending enough on defense. And we're going to have to factor that into what is already a very difficult public spending uh, agenda for the UK. So what happens to UK defense and European defense if Donald Trump is, for example, elected and says, actually, NATO needs reforming and we're going to give a lot less to it? Then the Europeans have to step up and fill the gap. And that's quite a big gap to fill because we're heavily dependent on the Americans for many strategic elements of our defense. I don't just mean the nuclear deterrent, but um, the ability to airlift large numbers of troops, for example, depends crucially on uh, American support. So um, we, we would need to invest quite a lot more money in defense. I think the important thing here is that um, the overall envelope of public spending cannot continue to expand. So when we talk about these things that we have to do, decarbonization, increasing our defense spending, we also have to talk about what we are going to do less of in order to be able to afford these things. That's the grown-up debate. And to be very honest with you, it's quite difficult to get that debate going in an election year. So how would you do it? You're, you know, you're always look at the numbers and always try to balance out. First of all, defense, does it need to go to 3% of GDP or is 500 million one-off enough? Uh, not yet 3% 3 3 of GDP. And money isn't the only issue. We've also got to be able to recruit enough people at the moment um, the defence establishment is struggling to recruit the people it needs to spend its current uh, budgets, to use its current budget allocations. So the two things go um, hand in hand. But I think, look, go back to what the Chancellor was just saying about growth. In the end, this is all about growth. If we have strong, uh, consistent economic growth, driven by productivity increases, not just by a growing population, um, then we will be able to afford to do more, including... Uh, over time, more public spending. Um, but first of all, we have to get that growth equation right. And al although it looks like we are now getting on top of the inflation problem, which has been the predominant theme for the last couple of years, we still have this long-term challenge in the UK that our productivity growth has been very flat for ever since the global financial crisis. Uh, and our economic growth uh, is simply not strong enough to support... Um, uh, an ageing population with a very sharply rising demand for public services. But, but so how do you actually fix the productivity problem? The US productivity numbers are a little bit better because yes, of a large number of, of immigrants actually coming to the country. Uh, does AI help with productivity? How, how would you go around it? Technology can indeed help with productivity, um, but we've got to make sure that we adopt and uh, innovate in the right way. Uh, that we seize the opportunities that are available. I agree with the Chancellor. I think the UK growth prospects are significant. We've got a very good track record of technology adoption. British people are very open uh, to, to using technological innovations in their everyday lives, more so than in many other countries. So the, the raw material is there, but we've got to make sure we seize the opportunity. And one of the challenges of democracy, of course, is that we have to persuade people that they want things to change. And people are very conservative with a small c, um, often don't like change. And it's about selling change to people, um, working out how in a democracy we have those big debates and we reach the right long-term decisions around these big, difficult issues. Because many of our adversaries and even many of our friends around the world who are competitors with us um, don't operate the same kind of democratic system, don't have to build the same kind of consensus that we do in the liberal democracies of, of Europe. So one of the more immediate, and these are longer term, extremely difficult subjects, mm. very important. On the short term, I mean, does it make more sense to increase defense spending or cut taxes? And, and that could also lay the foundation actually for f future growth either way. Well, look, I'm. Uh, strongly in favour of an agenda to cut taxes over time as we can afford to do so. But we can only cut taxes if our public spending um, is less than our tax receipts. Driving economic growth, achieving higher levels of economic growth should increase tax receipts and should ultimately enable us to have both lower taxes and higher spending on public services, including things like uh, defence. But we've got to do things in the right order. First, you grow your economy, and that requires investment, yep. 
maybe at the expense of consumption, but the consistent theme, if you look across countries around the world that have achieved decent levels of economic growth over long periods of time, the consistent theme is high levels of saving and high levels of investment. And we've got to do better in that area. Once we've done that, and we're running surpluses in our public finances, then we can start looking at cutting taxes. I'm afraid, as um, uh, Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng demonstrated a couple of years ago, trying to do it the other way around, cutting taxes first, funding it by borrowing, simply doesn't work. Philip Hammond, thank you so much. Uh, we'll come back to the former UK Chancellor of the Exchequer. We'll talk a little bit about investment and actually what investors tell him when he travels the world. Uh, we'll talk also geopolitical tensions. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Still with us, Philip Hammond, former UK Chancellor of the Exchequer and former Defence Secretary. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Hammond, for staying with us. We were having a good conversation about really the blueprint that you saw for, for the UK yeah. economy. When you look at uh, UK defence and foreign policy, it, should the UK continue to sell arms to Israel if they are in breach of international law? Well, we have very, a very clear and strict regime uh, about who we can and can't sell arms to. And these things are reviewed very intensively when there's a period of conflict or disturbance going on in the world. So, um, you know, it's not for me to second guess that, that judgment that will be made um, internally within government according to the rules. But we have one of the strictest arms export regimes in the world, and I'm confident that it'll be operated properly. Often people on the outside say, well, it's obvious you shouldn't be selling arms to this country or, or that country. Um, things are often a little bit more complex than that in terms of the way international law works and the way the rules are applied. When you look at, you know, we're on tenterhooks, and this was quite difficult four days in the Middle East trying to understand how Israel retaliates if they retaliate. Do you think uh, the Prime Minister will? Which Prime uh, Minister? Netanyahu. Uh, the Benjamin Prime Minister Netanyahu. of Israel. Look, I, I think it's very difficult for Israel not to retaliate in some form to this um, Iranian action. Um, Prime Minister Netanyahu will be getting urged from all sides, including the UK, to ensure that any response is uh, moderate and uh, non-escalationary. Um, I honestly don't believe the regime in Tehran wants to provoke an all-out um, war with the United States and Israel. That is not in their interest. But they also have their domestic audience that they have to um, satisfy. Prime Minister Netanyahu is in the same space. Mm -hmm. He has a very difficult domestic balancing act, and that's one of the big drivers in the evolving um, geopolitical situation um, in the Middle East. The trick, which the Americans in particular will be working on at the moment, is finding uh, an action that the Israelis can take which satisfies Israel's amour propre without yeah. provoking Iran into a further counter-response. I don't know what that is, but I... I hope but, very much that they manage to find something that works. OK, speaking about your Prime Minister, the UK Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, is there a chance, actually, that the Tories do something that will not be a complete wipeout at the next general election? Well, look, there's always a chance, um, because um, the world is an unstable and unpredictable place, and lots of things could happen between now and the autumn, when the election will probably um, be held. I think it's, it's um, what the Chancellor has said um, uh, to you is probably right, that the feel-good factor will be starting to creep back um, into the economy. So the econ economic situation after a very difficult um, few years post-COVID will start to look and feel um, a bit better. But we've got a long way to go, let's be honest. The polls are, are suggesting um, that the Conservative Party has a mountain to climb at the next election. Never say never, because events can uh, change people's minds very quickly. But is it possible for the Conservative Party to win it on the economy? Uh, I think it's a challenge, to be honest, because I think, although uh, I, I think the economy will be improving um, by the autumn, I think that many people have in their minds the um, events of the autumn of 2022, the mini-budget, the spike in interest rates and so on. Um, and, you know... The, the Tory party's um, principal uh, pitch to the public has always been 
our um, responsible management of the economy. I trust Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak completely on responsible man management of the economy, but I think what has happened um, in the recent past um, has, has, has damaged that brand, to be honest, and we've got to rebuild it. D d does it matter if the election is too close to the US election? Would that worry you? Uh, no, I suspect our election will be close to the US election. I think the, the question is whether it's just before or just after. Does it make a difference? Um, I, I really i am not sure. I'm not sure whether it makes a huge difference. Philip Hammond, thank you so much for joining us today. That was the former UK Chancellor of the Exchequer. Coming up, we talked to Poste Italiane Chief Executive Matteo Delfante as the Italian government prepares to sell almost a third of its stake. So we'll talk about uh, some of the challenges, of course, of privatization and then going back to the markets. So we also look at dollar, one of the biggest, as far as I remember, one of the biggest weeks we've had since, of course, all expectations on the Fed changed last Wednesday because of the inflation print. So we look at treasuries, markets, and of course we look at dollar strength. This is Bloomberg. Jake Powell signals the Fed will wait longer than previously anticipated to cut rates following a series of surprisingly high inflation readings. The latest CPI numbers in the UK are also stronger than expected, prompting traders to further unwind bets on how many rate cuts the BOE will deliver this year. Plus, chip machine giant ASML misses estimates on first quarter bookings, but it signals a stronger second half and sticks to its guidance. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. So the Italian government is preparing to sell almost a third of its stake in postal operator Poste Italiane, worth 4.4 billion euros. Now, the sale is crucial to Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni's plan to offload 20 billion euros worth of state-held assets by 2026. Now, let's get more from Poste Italiane Chief Executive Matteo Delfante. Mr. Delfante, thank you so much for joining us. Thank I mean, you. it's busy times, exciting times. So uh, we heard from the Italian government that they, they plan actually to sell a stake in Poste. Do you know how much and do you know by when? <laughs> <laughs> so I hear <laughs> or I read. <laughs> yeah, no, we, uh, we're we waiting for uh, instructions and uh, indication from uh, the shareholders. So, you know, we're just uh, managing the company. We presented our five-year plan on the 20th of March and we carry on business uh, as usual, waiting for uh, uh, directions. I'm, I'm sure you, you meet a number of investors. Do yeah. they understand what, what you have been building? Do you think there's a, you know, there'd be a fair valuation? So people are interested. They understand, you know, the opportunities and the challenges. I think now is uh, seven years that uh, you know we launched uh, the original uh, Deliver 2022 20, plan. Uh, investors starting to understand uh, the idea and the strategy of building uh, a multi-product uh, uh, platform. So we are showing them that we're delivering in every single uh, vertical, in every single product vertical, but we're getting the benefit uh, of the platform effect. So I think I find uh, investors uh, much more informed, much more interested into the story, and that's uh, you know, clearly creating good momentum for us. So, so have you also potentially you know, tested investor appetite for for a deal for they for do part it of the, it's kind of a reverse yeah, it's kind of reverse i mean they mentioned that if and when uh -huh. they would be interested but again you know we we have to wait for the right time as uh, you know the general manager of the uh, ministry of finance uh, stated uh, yesterday publicly so uh, talk to me a little bit i mean there, there's for example you, you have also a telecoms component so yeah. for, for foreign investors right yeah. they think of poste italiana they think of royal mail yeah. it's not the same institution because you're trying to build no. as you say like a multi-platform no i think uh, it's we're very different from uh, most of the uh, incumbent and historical uh, postal operator because we diversified starting from you know end of last uh, century so the real uh, market diversification started uh, uh, late 90s uh, uh, into financial products uh, 
and that's uh, you know postal savings which are government guaranteed is life uh, uh, insurance uh, saving products uh, then uh, uh, diversified into payments uh, and became uh, you know the largest uh, issuing payment uh, uh, institution in uh, in the country and uh, home services you know the post office is everywhere in Italy you know it's a natural place where to go and uh, you know buy uh, a home service uh, such as you know broadband uh, or electricity or gas uh, uh, retail always on the retail side so so when you look at your various you know businesses or actually angles what do you think will perform better than others in this kind of again inflationary environment maybe the ECB cuts but it's it's all a little bit uncertain well that's uh, we managed to stabilize our investment portfolio we take no credit risk by law so invest into government securities, uh, so we're mainly fixed rate, uh, so we're much less uh, sensitive to interest rate fluctu fluctuations. Uh, and in the plan, uh, the area that will grow the most over the next five years uh, is the everyday household needs. So is, uh, you know, the payments, uh, is uh, the TLC, is the energy and gas in terms of volumes. In terms of, you know, bottom line contribution, you know, the lion's share is still with our insurance uh, and postal savings, which is, you know, the core. Is, is there any appetite in, for example, increasing your exposure to telecoms, Telecom Italia, maybe looking for a partner after the sale of the grid? No, I think it's, you know, we, we have, uh, you yeah, know, a small 5% market share and it's uh, is enough. I think the government has uh, uh, designed a specific uh, road for that company and that's uh, fine by us, obviously. So is there any change? Like, what are your day-to-day -day challenges? Is I it think really it's, just... uh, that's a good question. I think it's really uh, execution, execution, execution. The plan is there. It has been an acceleration of the final uh, end uh, of the last plan uh, and now we have to basically execute on it uh, mainly on two uh, lines. One, uh, uh, getting closer to clients uh, with our commercial service model in financial products. So we need to be and become a bit more dynamic, not trans transactional but more relational. Uh, oriented uh, in the post office uh, and then there is the big uh, transition of the operation of mail. Italy unfortunately is uh, very very low volumes in mail and that is pushing us to do something before UK, Germany, France uh, or the US will have to do it. Why? Why is it so low? Uh, historical reasons, uh, you know, seven years ago there was a very good uh, um, uh, invoicing uh, and procurement uh, electronic uh, um, law. So in Italy there are no more paper invoices uh, since uh, seven years. Uh, Italians are not using uh, for personal reasons uh, or private reasons uh, mail as much as I see you know, around Europe. Uh, uh, bottom line, we have uh, 35 items uh, per year per head uh, with uh, you know, a European average of 130, yeah. which is bad news in terms of volumes and business, uh, and we have to turn it uh, into you know, a good news, an opportunity to put our network uh, to do something else. And obviously that's uh, parcel. You also, parcel, I mean, which are increasing, I imagine. Yeah. I mean, yeah. do you see the, the volumes after COVID yeah, there has been a kind of, right? uh, you know, there has been, a, you know, le leveling off just after COVID, but then, you know, the market started uh, growing, you know, high single digit uh, uh, from, you know, to 2022 onwards, really. Um, Mateo, I was also excited to have you on because we talk about economies and we talk about, yeah. you know, consumer spending in the abstract, but you live yeah. this every day because you have customers that you interact with that yeah. you see and you see the numbers. What is the health, actually, of... Of the, of the Italian consumer right now? The, what we see from our data, we also run you know, some uh, small uh, models of now casting, trying to understand you know, how things are really developing uh, short term. And the signals uh, we have is that uh, you know, consumption is uh, relatively holding relatively well. Um, we don't see the investment side. Uh, it's true that the consumption of our mass clients, because we're really on the mass, you know, the men of the street. Yeah. We're not on the, you know, high net worth uh, uh, client base. Uh, is uh, uh, mainly anchor around uh, primary goods. 
Okay, so you have less volatility around those, uh, but uh, from from our uh, point of view, is uh, you know demand is uh, is holding. I mean, the ECB may be the first one to cut, which is quite incredible. I mean, if you told me this two months <laughs> yes, ago, no one, no one w would have believed it. Yeah. Would it be welcome, actually, for your customers, an interest rate cut? Uh, I think, you know, from our client's standpoint, is not a major, you know, okay. it's more on the, you know, industrial uh, and, and production side, you know, the banking sector, you know, there are players, you know, our client base doesn't really have, you know, maybe the mortgage side, Mortgage started uh, since uh, nine months uh, to to go down, so that's what retail probably will be more sensitive to. Uh, Matteo, going back to the share sale, and I know you yeah. can, you know you're, you you say you're expecting a call to yeah. to say when and where. I don't know if I hundred percent believe that, but so w when I mean the markets are quite volatile at the moment, yeah. right? Because of the Middle East, there's a lot of unknowns. Like, do, do you worry th about just the market volatility unrelated to Poste Italiane? Yeah. Yeah, obviously, you know, uh, from what we see, there is still uh, relatively good uh, liquidity. Markets are open for primary and secondary offerings, uh, uh, from what we hear from uh, uh, brokers. Uh, uh, timing is everything yeah. in markets, uh, but, you know, we're here for the long run. So, you know, uh, we're not, uh, you know, worried. Okay, thank you so much for joining us. That was Posse Italiane Chief Executive Officer Matteo Delfante with us in London today. Now, coming up, we talk luxury. LVMH shares up after first quarter update was a little bit better than actually most people feared. So more next on why the luxury sector sentiment has soured generally. This is Bloomberg. The UK Chancellor Jeremy Hunt actually says a prospect of interest rate cuts later this year would lift the mood of voters, hinting that the government will not call a general election until the autumn. Well, that's a decision for the independent Bank of England, just like sure. here in the US. Um, that decision is taken independently. And they have to look at lots of things. I mean, we've still got very strong wage growth data. It's been going up for nine months in a row in, in real terms. Um, but I think the big message from today is that the IMF are saying that inflation is going to be 1.2% lower. Uh, there are people who are now forecasting inflation will be lower in the UK than in the US or possibly even the Eurozone. And so, you know, that situation we were in 18 months ago with inflation at 11.1%, that is well and truly behind us. And if you're looking forward in terms of longer term growth prospects, uh, the IMF today are saying that the UK will grow faster than France, Germany or Italy over the next six years. So we think we have very strong growth prospects. So you aren't concerned at all about what potentially could happen to parts of the UK economy like the labour market if policy were to take, stay too tight for too much longer given what you are saying is a downward trajectory in inflation? Well, obviously, um, in the short term, we look to the Bank of England to get that fine judgment right. But what uh, finance ministers like me can do is much more about the longer term competitiveness of the UK economy. And uh, we note that the IMF today say there's a whole section about the impact of AI on the UK economy uh, because they recognize that London is now the world's second largest epicenter for AI R&D after San Francisco mm. and there's a huge amount happening in our tech economy which is third only to uh, the US and China globally and that is really where the, the big growth in the future is going to come in the UK and that's where we think is makes it a very exciting bet for investors. Well and your point is taken Chancellor that you oversee the fiscal side not the monetary side so on the fiscal side you have suggested that an election could happen potentially as soon as October. Should we expect another potential fiscal event between now and then or have we seen all we're going to see on that front before the votes are cast. Well, it's certainly the case that, um, you know, the feel-good factor as uh, interest rates start to come down, as people start to feel higher real disposable incomes, uh, will be stronger in people's minds uh, come the early autumn than it is now. People have been through a very bruising period. Uh, obviously, decisions about election timing are for the Prime Minister, and 
were we to have an October election, as I've said before, it would be possible to have a fiscal event in September. But we would decide uh, much nearer the time whether that was the right thing to do. Well, of course, you've already delivered a lot fiscally in terms of tax cuts, including personal tax cuts. And yet, when you look at polls, obviously, the Conservative Party is still running significantly behind Labour, I believe, by roughly 20 points. What else may need to be done on that front to convince UK voters to keep the Conservatives in power? What would you consider doing? Well, I'd be very cautious about looking at those polls because, um, first of all, as we can see from the challenges facing incumbent governments, not just in the UK, but in, in the US and sure. Germany, France, uh, the electorate have been through a really difficult period uh, with an energy shock, mm -hmm. uh, with high inflation, uh, with a pandemic. Um, but when it comes to a general election, it's a choice about the future. It's not a referendum on how you feel right now. And that becomes a very different uh, decision in people's minds. That was the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, Jeremy Hunt, speaking to us in New York. Now, for some of the other stories making news today, well, Bloomberg has learned that Morgan Stanley plans to cut about 50 investment banking jobs in the Asia-Pacific region starting this week. At least 80% of the reductions are likely to be in Hong Kong and China. Now, Emirates is halting all check-ins for passengers for the day as bad weather in Dubai disrupts travel in one of the busiest aviation hubs in the world. While Dubai has seen torrential rains and heavy flooding, prompting flight cancellations, school closures and traffic disruptions. Now, it stemmed partly from cloud seeding operations that are meant to encourage rainfall in the UAE. And LVMH shares are higher after its first quarter update was better than feared. Now, the world's biggest luxury group has been hit by weak demand for cognac and champagne, posting its worst quarter results since 2020. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Andrea Felstead from Bloomberg Opinion. Always great to speak to you, Andrea, because you understand, the, you know, really this industry like, like no one else almost. When you look at, you know, it's better than feared. I mean, there was a real fear that LVMH, that for so long, was frankly killing it, like doing so much better than Caring and some of their other rivals w would get hit quite hard this quarter. Well, they have been hit quite hard. I mean, there's really very little growth. All the growth came from pricing. It's 2% for fashion and leather goods, excluding the pandemic period when stores were shut and everything was shut down. This is the weakest since 2016. And at that time, we we're in the midst of that anti sort of ostentation cut, cut down in, in China. So this, yes, it has been hit. We mustn't forget this is a big slowdown. So when you look at LVMH, I mean, they have everything, right? They have the makeup, they have the clothes, they have the bags. They have Louis Vuitton, which makes a sizable chunk, chunk of everything. They also have the drinks. Where did we see the most weakness? The weakness is actually in the drinks. And it's the same factors that's hitting luxury. Some of those sort of aspirational U.S. consumers have cut back on, you know, pricey drinks as well as pricey handbags, as well as weak demand in China. So that, that was worse than was expected. And so where do we see the best strength? And if LVMH is, is, you know, it doesn't have a great set of numbers, even if it's better than expected, what does that mean for the rest of the industry? Well, the, a great strength within, was in Sephora. They haven't seen the same downturn in US demand for beauty that Ulta said. So that's a positive. I think LVMH will turn out to be one of the better performers, just as we shouldn't have taken the profit warning from Kering last month as a sign for the rest of the industry. We shouldn't really take this as a sign for the rest of the industry. LVMH, it's massive. No. It's got the resources to invest, to shout louder than anyone else. So, you're, so their brands are at the forefront of consumers' minds. Hermes will probably do well. Brunello, Cuccinelli, um, Kering, we know will be weak. I'd keep an eye on Burberry. Uh, that, that's in a bit of a tricky spot, trying to elevate its product, do a new creative direction at, um, at a time when things are difficult. Richemont, probably good on jewellery. LVMH watches are tough, so that's one to uh, watch too. So is the trend, Andrea, still going for, you know, ultra, ultra high net worth? Yes. So price increases, the ultra, is it still about quiet luxury? Um, there are increasing signs that quiet luxury has peaked. I mean, we're just looking at some of the TikTok aesthetics that are coming through, this kind of louder luxury, the mob wife, the big fur coat, the loud makeup. That was a sign that quiet luxury has peaked. The very Western trend we see at the moment, not exactly quiet. So um, I, think, I think we could see a change in that over the next few months. I mean, the maximalism definitely speaks to my Italian heritage. <laughs> I know you're much more chic. No. Why, is it, why is Hermes keep on 
doing well. Is it smaller volumes and just more handcrafted? Um, Hermes is, is in a really a different position because it's got wait lists for its iconic bags so it can effectively dictate its own demand. It's also carrying on raising prices. It perhaps didn't raise prices quite as much as, say, Chanel when everyone else was increasing. So it's got a little bit more scope to raise prices. And there's a halo effect. You know, we might not all be able to afford a Birkin, but we can afford a Hermes scarf or some Hermes makeup. So it's got those three factors going in its favour. Actually, it is incredible the number of luxury companies going more into makeup, yes. right? We could expect, like, I don't know if Prada's looking at this or whether it has, but is this going to be a, a, a viable source of revenue for yes. them? What it, what it, what has happened happened is with the price increases over the last few years and that everybody wants to cater to the one percent they've effectively priced out a huge cohort of the market they need to find ways to reconnect with that segment without damaging their brands and beauty is one way to do that wonderful andrea thank you so much for all of the insight andrea felstead there from bloomberg opinion looking at luxury and luxury stocks now coming up asml reports worse than expecting bookings for the first quarter so more on the dutch chip machine makers results next this is bloomberg India's elections kick off with a focus on the economy, social divisions, and climate change actions that will influence the global story. Bloomberg is live on location with the latest updates from the world's largest democracy. Coverage begins April 19th. Well, ASML down this morning after new orders fell short of estimates for the first quarter. Europe's largest technology firm has been hit by a slowdown in demand from the chip-making industry. Well, we're now joined by Bloomberg Sarah Jacob in Amsterdam. Sarah, thank you for joining us. So ASML's new orders in the first quarter actually fell short of expectations. Why? Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, so ASML reported $3.6 billion uh, in new orders for the first quarter, um, and that is because the companies have been hurt by the downturn in demand for its most advanced machines from chip makers. So to put it in context, the fourth quarter bookings were a record 9.2 billion euros. Um, and ASML CFO today said that, you know, this sort of illustrates how the order intake process is typically quite lumpy. Uh, this quarter is really also a story about uh, how orders for ASML's um, extreme ultraviolet machines fell to 656 million euros in the first quarter from 5.6 billion euros in the fourth quarter, again, due to the downturn in the industry. So how does China really factor into this and what is ASML's outlook for the year, Sarah? So China has become the biggest market for ASML due to a drop in the share of the other markets, and business from that market has remained relatively resilient. Uh, from the outlook point of view, ASML has forecast net sales for the second quarter to be weaker than was uh, anticipated, but it has kept its outlook for the full year unchanged. Uh, it expects 2024 total net sales to be similar to 2023. Uh, the company expects the second half of the year actually to be stronger than the first half. Uh, the CFO also said today that it's pretty clear that the industry is in its upturn um, and the company is sort of building up for a stronger year in 2025. Sarah, thank you so much. Sarah Jacob in Amsterdam. There are the very latest on ASML. And let's also quickly look at some of the biggest moves that we've seen in the last couple of days and what this means today. Now, Treasury yields, uh, currently you can see the U.S. 10-year, actually the, the U.S. 10-year at 46366, uh, trading in a narrow range, but still near 2024 highs. A gauge of the dollar actually holding near a five-month high after Jay Powell said yesterday that it would likely take longer to have confidence that inflation is headed towards the central bank's target. Up next, Bloomberg Brief.